Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the Physics Department of the University of Michigan. By the Dr. M. Lois Tiffany Endowment. And by gifts from friends of the program. Local broadcast is made possible in part by Pfizer. and gentlemen, the last time I was here in uh, Ann Arbor, I remember pulling up in the rental car from the Detroit airport and stepping out of the car and seeing that wonderful eclipse of the moon. And also, I had been listening to the Red Sox game. They were just in the uh, uh, runner-up to go into the World Series and to break the curse that had uh, uh, stuck with them so many years. And now here I am again. Uh, maybe I should schedule coming to Ann Arbor more often. <laughs> uh, how many of you have seen the comet in the last week? Well, quite a few of you know about it, but the rest of you should. Uh, this is an amazing thing. The comet was known to be there by the astronomers, but uh, it was faint, 17th magnitude. You needed a really big telescope. And then about uh, 10 days or so ago, uh, within 48 hours, this comet increased in its brightness by a factor of a million f for reasons that are just not understood, totally unexpected. It became a naked eye object. It's a second magnitude object in the constellation of Perseus. So if you don't know much about the sky, probably you should be armed with a pair of binoculars. Uh, you go out and look to the northeast soon after sunset, but it's going on uh, through the night. There's one really bright star over there. That's Capella. Then you go straight above Capella, scanning with your binoculars. You'll see this round, fuzzy object looking not like a comet because it doesn't seem to have a tail. It is moving directly away from the Earth. It's out beyond Mars now. Uh, and apparently moving tail first so that the tail is hidden behind the coma. So you just see this round, fuzzy disk, but it's rather fascinating. You can see it with your naked eye. The binoculars will help. Uh, so uh, I think it's supposed to be clear tonight. So good luck. Hope you have an opportunity to actually uh, see this remarkable object that is amazing everybody so much. I'm going to speak about four famous myths uh, back there in the 16th and 17th centuries. First of all, that by the time of Copernicus, planetary mechanisms were so encumbered with epicycles on epicycles that the whole system was about to collapse. This expression has registered as part of the uh, general mythology. It, only a few years go by and you see another paper in the Physical Review or the Astronomical Journal where the uh, author apologizes and having a theory that's too complicated. He says, maybe my theory has too many epicycles in it. Let me go back and talk about that presently. Uh, secondly, that Copernicus's heliocentric system, by putting the sun rather than the earth into the middle, greatly improved the accuracy of the planetary predictions. But ultimately, he blew it because he didn't find the ellipse. I'll analyze that one for you. Kepler, coming several generations later, in the early 1600s, fitting a curve through Tycho's daily records of Mars, finally discovered that the planetary orbits are elliptical. Tycho Brahe, that famous guy, the Danish astronomer, uh, famous for having lost part of his nose in a duel and replacing it with a uh, prosthetic, and it was said that he had some special ointment in his pocket. He could pop in the middle of a debate, very disconcerting to his opponent. Uh, 
uh, it, those guys, they, it was a relative. They were fighting over who was the best mathematician after a Christmas party. I'm sure they were both solidly drunk. They went out, they flailed their swords. It was said to be so dark they couldn't see their swords before their eyes. It was lucky for Tico that he, that they missed his eyes uh, because uh, it, was a, it was close there. He had remarkable eyesight. Uh, there, there was a book published later in, the, in that century, rather in the next century, uh, around 1660, a thick book like this in which the author tried to show all of the observations of the sun, moon, and planets that were made uh, uh, prior to 1630. The observations from the antiquity and the Middle Ages occupy about this much of the space in that book. The observations by Tycho Brahe occupy this much. This, it's, it's wonderful to see the book, to see what an incredible breakthrough there was by those observations he was making before the telescope, naked eye observations, but with very accurately calibrated scales. Uh, in fact, there's only, it's only been twice in astronomy that there's been that much of a breakthrough in the uh, enlargement of the database. That second time is what we're living through right now. We're going through this with the Sloan Digital Survey and lots of other kinds of surveying of the heavens that are just enormously increasing our database. And that, the first time that happened and the only other time was when Tycho Brahe came. So you get the idea that Tycho is out there every night busily observing where all the planets are. Wrong. Tycho was very much motivated by particular uh, attempts to do solve specific problems. Like a modern scientist, uh, he wasn't just recording everything that was going on. He was focused for what he wanted. And in particular, he was hoping that he could find the distance to the planet Mars. Now, how can you do that? Well, if you could sight Mars from two different places, you could triangulate to Mars. And he could do that, and it's easy to understand how, if you think of the Copernican system with the Earth rotating. You make an observation of Mars in the evening, and the rotation of the Earth carries you around, and you make another one in the morning. You have a data, you have a baseline for this. You can hopefully triangulate. And Tycho would have got it if the solar system had been as small as everyone from antiquity through Copernicus had believed. But they were wrong by a factor of 20. And so it was, the distances were too great, but nevertheless, each time Mars came really close, that is to say about every other year, he made, he had a regular campaign of observing Mars to get it as accurately as he could. And the first time through, it didn't give a decent answer. He tried it again. And finally, on the third time, he thought he had got the solution. It turns out to be an error caused by a phenomenon that we call refraction. Uh, because he was looking for something very, very small. He was a good enough scientist to go back and make further observations on refraction and realized that he hadn't got it. Uh, but the result of making such very accurate observations of Mars, driving it as far as he could, essentially provided the database for Kepler. And I'll come back to that in a moment. 
Galileo's telescopic observations, and now with the invention of the telescope, it's 400 years ago next year, so we're going to have the anniversary of the telescope, and I think you're going to find out more about it during that year, finally proved the motion of the Earth and thereby established the truth of the Copernican system. Another myth. So let's go back and have a look at these. Let's start out with this business of Copernicus and the planetary mechanisms. First of all, let me show you the way that uh, Ptolemy was looking at it. And here you can see uh, a manuscript of a Latin version of uh, Ptolemy's Almagest coming from antiquity. Uh, here is the Earth. It's not in the center of the circle, but it's in the center of the universe. Uh, and here is this carrying circle, which carries this uh, epicycle on it. Why an epicycle? Because if you look, let us say, at Mars, and you follow it over a long period of time, you discover that normally, like the moon, it moves across among the stars from west toward east. But every other year, approximately, it will come to a stop in this motion and go backwards, the so-called retrograde motion, which we know now from the Copernican system is caused by the faster moving Earth bypassing Mars and making Mars appear to slip backwards for uh, some weeks. That can be done by having an epicycle which can swing backwards. But you will notice that uh, that's not the entire structure. There's another spot up here called the equant about which uniform motion takes place. So that in one quarter of the period, the epicycle would be carried through 90 degrees around that point, and in the next quarter, it goes another 90 degrees, but obviously on this carrying circle, it's going to have to go faster here uh, than it, because it has a lot more uh, ground to cover, so to say. So uh, this, these are, are the basic structure of how Ptolemy is going to account for the motion of Mars, of Jupiter, and Saturn, and so on. Now, there are uh, some problems in trying to uh, do this. Uh, maybe I should come back in a moment to this slide because I want to show you what would happen if you wanted to improve it just a little bit and do something further by having another epicycle. Uh, you could have a little epicycle over here. And then you could have maybe that same epicycle at a different place. Notice that as seen from the Earth, the effect here uh, is going to be larger when this epicycle is closer to the Earth than when it was over in this position. Now, let's go back to uh, uh, the standard tables. Uh, which are called the Alphonsine Tables. There's King Alfonso of Spain. He was, uh, this is in the uh, 13th century, and uh, his astronomers were making tables whereby you could make this, uh, these kind of calculations. Now, clearly, if you have the planet moving sometimes faster and sometimes slower, you have to have some corrections for this. So you can have a table of numbers that goes around for every degree in the orbit as to how much you correct it for this change in the speed. Then you have another table uh, for the epicycle, uh, the effect of the epicycle. But now, that is a little bit more complicated because if you have a, a calculation for every degree around here, and you don't have to go 360 degrees because it's symmetrical. You can just do it for 180 degrees. But look, 
you're going to get a different correction here than if that epicycle is around on the other side. So what you would really need would be a double entry table of 180 positions here versus 180 positions here. And this would be a huge table and that isn't what you just saw. Ptolemy was very clever. He figured out how you could do it with two single entry columns and a clever way of multiplying them against each other to put the correction in. Saves a lot of paper if you just have to have two columns, 180 each, instead of 180 times 180. Now, you get this other little epicycle, wow, the problem now is 180 by 180 by 180. Nobody in the Middle Ages was clever enough to know how to get around that. So the answer is they didn't do that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, there's this famous legend about Alfonso looking over the shoulder of his astronomers and saying that if he had been around at creation, he could have given the good Lord some hints. Uh, <laughs> the idea being don't make it so complicated. And that, I suppose, is where this uh, idea of epicycles on epicycles came from. It emerged towards the end of the 19th century. It's not been possible to pin down exactly who it was who first said it, but it certainly uh, in, got embedded in the literature. Now why would you want to have another epicycle or something to correct it a little bit? Well, let's look here at the errors in longitude as you go around the sky. And here it is labeled by degrees and you see that the Ptolemaic theory putting the best modern numbers into it uh, keeps giving errors of up here to two degrees uh, and then whoops, all of a sudden you get this four degree error. And that repeats uh, and it comes around approximately every 17 years. The question is, did anybody notice it? Uh, and so I started looking to see, and here in Tycho Brahe's record books, he actually tabulates it this way. He shows the position of Mars in uh, August 10th, 1593 uh, in longitude. Uh, this is how they did it in those days. That means, uh, that's the symbol for the uh, constellation Pisces. You can see that the positions uh, differ uh, very substantially and what Tycho observed was that Mars was just about in the middle between the extremes either given by Copernicus or given by uh, Alfonso on the Ptolemaic system. So he knew it went out and he knew that Mars's orbit was somehow in trouble but he didn't know quite what to do with it. But this was one of the reasons why when Kepler came to work for him, Kepler was assigned to see if he could figure out what was going on with respect to Mars. Whether, he, whether Tycho told Kepler that Mars misbehaved this way, uh, there just isn't any evidence accepting that. Kepler himself mentions it for the time uh, some years later when the same phenomenon was taking place. Uh, he, uh, he mentioned that uh, Mars could get five degrees out in the Copernican tables and in fact Kepler was able to figure out how to do it. But I wondered if anybody else had noticed it. We have such a paucity of observations from the Middle Ages, but I found that Regiomontanus, who was the most brilliant astronomer of the uh, 15th century, uh, he, uh, I wondered, I looked in his observations and in 1565 he records only one observation the whole year and it's an observation of Mars. Does he tell us exactly how, what degree Mars is at and how it uh, works out? Uh, no. He tells us that Mars 
was seen as being one and a half times the distance between these two stars and slightly above the line. So we can guess that this is where he was observing Mars. Now if you get the tables and make the computation, Mars is predicted over here. So there is some discrepancy. But how did Regiomontanus know where Mars was? Well, he had to know where these stars were. And those stars are affected by what we call the problem of precession, which was not under very good control at that time. So the average astronomer who was looking into this wouldn't really know if Mars was out of kilter with respect to the tables or not. He had to be sophisticated enough to be able to figure out where those stars were. So the average astronomer would probably figure that he had just made a mistake and not worry about it anymore. It's as if you are going out to observe Mars and you made your best to get an accurate position and it didn't match with the nautical almanac. Would you telephone the Naval Observatory and say, you better look at your tables? No, <laughs> you'd figure you'd made some simple mistake or something. So uh, you have to understand the ethos of the whole run-up to the time of Copernicus was not something that you're looking for mistakes in the tables. And in fact, the interesting thing is that Copernicus himself, though he said if he could get the positions, predict the positions of the planets to 10 minutes of arc, that is to say about one third the diameter of the moon, he would be as happy as could be. He made some contemporary observations. He used mostly as his database the observations already given in Ptolemy's Almagest. Copernicus did try to check up on the parameters, the size of the orbit, the size compared to the Earth's orbit, and so on, with modern observations just to check if it was still, they were still basically the same. For one of his observations of Mars, he was two degrees out. And for another one of Mars, he was uh, something over a degree wrong. So with a database like that, you can't figure that he was going to make a great breakthrough in the precision. Basically, the Copernican revolution to move to a heliocentric system was just a geometrical transformation which did not automatically buy you any further accuracy. Here you can see Copernicus and the picture which is in his De Revolutionibus. The book which was published finally uh, at the end of Copernicus's life. He lay on his deathbed when the final pages were delivered to him and he knew that his book was done. The front matter, the index, the title page and so on arrived uh, on the very day that he died in 1543. This near the beginning of the book shows this remarkable heliocentric system. Copernicus did not have any proof of the Earth's motion. In fact, he says it was a theory pleasing to the mind, something in mind's eye which he saw. Uh, it, uh, I suppose he would have liked to have had some sort of a proof, but that was not easily forthcoming. Uh, what he noticed was that if he rearranged the planets, he ended up with Mercury here in the middle, and Mercury is the fastest planet. It goes around the sun in 88 days, Venus in 22, uh, sorry, 225, uh, and here uh, the Earth in 365 days, Saturn, the most lethargic of the planets, takes about 30 years to get around. Copernicus says, in no other way do we find this harmonious relation between the size of the orbit and its period. That aesthetic idea, this uh, 
unity of the system was so compelling to him that there was no turning back. He wanted to explore what he could do with this arrangement rather than having the earth in the middle. But for most of the people who saw the book, this was a totally ridiculous idea. I mean, if the earth is spinning on its axis every 24 hours and you throw a stone in the air, it's going to land in another county. And think of the, uh, of the earth going around at a dizzying speed every year, carrying the moon with it by some strange, completely crazy, ununderstood, mysterious fashion. There wasn't any physics to back this up. People looking at his book thought, what a marvelous recipe book. One can calculate the positions of planets, and he's pulled a few tricks that make it a little bit easier. But it's not generating more accuracy, and as far as physical reality, you've got to be kidding. Uh, this was not being accepted as the way to do things, but it was a marvelous idea, and among other things, he finally had a reasonable explanation for why that retrograde motion appears. It's because the Earth, being faster than Mars, overtakes it. Here's Mars going around, and here comes the Earth. Uh, it's like you're driving down the superhighway on the interstate. You're in the fast car. As you pass the slower one, and look where it seems to be against the distant scenery, that car will move backwards momentarily as you're doing the overtaking. And that's the same thing for retrograde motion, and you get a natural explanation for it. So these things together were the parts that were very important for Copernicus. But by the way, in that diagram, those are not orbits. In fact, what he's given is a zone where the machinery takes place. Because the typical representation of the planets here in the Ptolemaic system was that you do it as follows. You have to have the orbit or the motion eccentrically placed, but you add this extra lunula of ether to make it come out as a circle on the center, and you fill it in here, so you have a kind of plenum universe, and then you can just build the next planet right on in the same way, and you have the little epicycle uh, in there off-center. Copernicus had to have this off-center motion, too, and that's why those perfectly circular lines are just drawing the boundary zones where you place than the eccentric orbit inside. But look, here are the Prutenic tables which were based on Copernicus's book, and you end up with this same uh, disaster uh, coming periodically for the position of Mars. Uh, so there you can see the, the error again and what to do about it. Well, we turn now to Johannes Kepler. I've already indicated that uh, there's a problem with this, about Kepler fitting a curve through, these, uh, through the positions in order to get his ellipse. This is the ellipse as published in his book, The Astronomia Nova, 1609. Truly the new astronomy. And it's wonderful because here's this goddess in the chariot riding up with the laurel wreath to crown Kepler for thinking of such a neat idea. <laughs> but let's look a little bit closer at the reality of it. He shows how you can triangulate to get to Mars. But this is a different kind of triangulation than what Tycho Brahe was doing to get the distance. Uh, this is a little different. You see. Here's Mars, and it moves more slowly as it goes around so that the Earth in the meantime is going all the way around and then back to here when Mars returns to exactly the same place. And now Mars goes around again and the Earth goes all the way around and here. 
And so you get these different positions of the Earth in its orbit pointing to uh, Mars. And if you could just get a whole bunch of points like that, you could do the curve fitting. But now, as I already told you, Tycho was not observing Mars just every night. He was making great observations when Mars was so-called at opposition, when it was about opposite the Sun. But positions like this and this were very hard to find in Tycho's records book. Books. And you can see in Kepler's surviving notebooks his frustrated search for combinations like this that could pin down Mars at a particular place. And altogether, he managed to get approximately eight of them, which isn't enough positions to do this. So basically, he had to do it in some other way. And it's very subtle. Let me show you the circular orbit of Mars, and now let me show you the elliptical orbit of Mars. And now let's just compare them. <laughs> you see, the secret is that you have to have it eccentric. The circle has to be displaced from the center, and Copernicus and Ptolemy have done that. But that's not the whole story. Uh, the bowing in, the ellipticity, goes according to one half of the eccentricity squared. So if the eccentricity of the, cir the placement of the uh, circle is off by 10%, then you take 0.1 and you square it and you get 0.01 and you take half of that. So it's one half of a percent. It is a very, very tiny coming in. So how, how can you get that? It's so very subtle. Now Kepler was different from the astronomers who had preceded him. Most astronomers felt it was their duty to do geometry. Kepler wanted to do physics. He wanted to have physical principles at the basis for what he was doing. And in particular, there was a problem for him. Because how, what keeps the heavens going? Well, in the Ptolemaic period, when the Earth was fixed solidly at the middle, the fastest thing going around was the stars every 24 hours. And how did that happen? God was outside it all, and according to Aristotle, it was the love of God that kept the heavens going. And so they spun from the outside. But if you're on a Copernican system, the starry frame is fixed solid, and all the motion has to be coming from the middle emanating from the Sun, which makes Mercury go the fastest and Saturn rather slower. So what's the physics coming from the Sun? Well, Kepler didn't know, but Kepler figured that if the Earth is displaced, not centered on the Sun, it had better be going faster when it's closer to the Sun and slower when it's farther away from the Sun. And that wasn't true in the Copernican system. Copernicus just wasn't quite Copernican enough. He, he didn't, he treated the Earth separately because the, Earth, the Sun had been treated separately in Ptolemy's system. And when he did the transformation, he had the Earth going around at a constant speed. Kepler proposed what he called the law of areas. That turns out to be an absolutely fundamental principle of physics. Today, we talk about it as the conservation of angular momentum. We're going to put a little bit of light on this so you can see the model. I will give it a certain amount of rotation. And now as I move it closer to the center, you will see how much faster it goes. This is 
a demonstration of the conservation of angular momentum. And it is the principle that Kepler stumbled on by having his law of areas, by asking the uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, our wonderful demonstrators here have come up with this beautiful uh, way of showing it. When Kepler made that change, he discovered that then the, this disappeared. What he had to do was to make an adjustment so that the earth moved at different speeds. So here is the situation. That great catastrophe always happened when the Earth and Mars were just about in line for about the closest approach that the Earth gets to Mars. You see, when it happens over here, it's a lot farther away. And what Kepler was obliged to do was to reposition the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit by sliding it slightly sideways to account for this speed up of the Earth when it was closer. He essentially moved the Earth a little bit this way because sliding the circle along this line pushes it back and would move the positions of position of the Earth. And once you got the position of the Earth correct as it goes around near Mars, that error spike disappears. So in one swoop, by being a physicist rather than a geometer, Kepler managed to improve the accuracy of the predictions by a whole order of magnitude. So that the error went down from uh, about nearly five degrees to just half a degree. But Tycho Brahe's observations were so good, they were good to about uh, one to two minutes of arc. Kepler said God had given him such a great observer in Tycho that he could not ignore this. And he went to work to try to go beyond this. And using the law of areas, he discovered that the law of areas would not give the correct air, uh, prediction of position as it went around unless you could just pick up a little bit less area. And you do that by pulling the circle in on its sides so that as you're counting the area swept out as you go around, you have to have a figure which is not a circle but something inside and Kepler realized that if he had an ellipse that would do it just right. So from that physical point of view he was able to come up with what we now know is the right kind of shape for the orbit. It's not a whale of a lot difference. All the astronomy textbooks have to show it greatly, grossly exaggerated for the, uh, to show an ellipse because otherwise you get into the same situation I just showed you, that the circle and the ellipse are scarcely different. But with that subtlety, he was then able to get the predictions for Mars down to under two minutes of arc. So that in his work, he essentially made two orders of magnitude greater accuracy possible for the predictions. And in a sense, Kepler was just being more Copernican than Copernicus and got the whole system straightened out. So what we think of as the Copernican system, really in its details, are the Keplerian system. Here is a famous diagram from his manuscripts which are preserved uh, in St. Petersburg at the archive there. Uh, and you can see uh, him working uh, not to find the position of Mars, but to figure out the position of the Earth's orbit and to move it slightly to accommodate this. And therefore, it's part of the steps to get that straightened out. Here we have the fourth of the myths, 
that Galileo's telescopic observations finally proved the motion of the Earth and thereby at last established the truth of the Copernican system. What I want to assure you is that in general, science does not operate by proofs. You hear that an awful lot about uh, science uh, looking for propositions that can be falsified, that proof plays this big role. Uh-uh. It is coherence of explanation, understanding things that are well knit together. The broader the framework of knitting the things together, the more uh, we're able to uh, believe it. So that if you look in most astronomy textbooks, it gives you the proofs for the motion of the Earth. It tells you about the Foucault pendulum, which demonstrates the rotation of the Earth. It tells you about an annual parallax, this tiny variation in the position of stars caused by the Earth being on one side of the sun in June and on the other side in January. But when Foucault swung his famous pendulum, around 1850, 1851, there wasn't dancing in the streets the next morning because at last the Copernican system had been proved. By that time it was irrelevant because the whole system that Isaac Newton had proposed was so coherent in its explanations that it just hung together and was believable. And Galileo was one of the people in that process of making the uh, Copernican system intellectually respectable. And how did he do that? Well, here's his telescope. It's amazing. He must have sent out uh, scores of telescopes to nobility all over Europe and so on, but only two well-documented examples survive, both of them in the History of Science Museum in Florence. And what did he do with this? Well, this is for me probably the most exciting single manuscript page in the history of science. This is Galileo's observing log of Jupiter in January of 1610. He starts out, he finds Jupiter here with little stars on each side of it. Curious. He decides for what reasons he knew not, what reasons fate governed him not, he says. Uh, and went the next night and saw that the little stars were on the other side of the planet. And then the next night they were again a different combination. He thought he knew which way Jupiter was moving. It seemed wrong. Somehow he couldn't quite figure it out. So he's now started observing it and making his record book night after night uh, to record what he saw. And finally, after he had been observing for several days, he discovered there were not three but four little stars accompanying Jupiter. And he does it a second time that night, he says, or better. And he tries to do it again, getting their positions a little bit more accurately. By the end of this first week of observing, when you turn the page over, something happens. This is all in Italian. On the back side, as the observations continue, they're in Latin. Why? Because Latin was the international language of science. He knew then that he had something to write home about, so to say. Not writing home, really writing for an international audience of uh, intelligent people, of scientists, of astronomers who would be really astonished by this. He publishes very, very quickly a little book called The Sidereus Nuncius or the, Sid or the Starry Messenger. It is dedicated to Cosimo de' Medici in Florence because he's looking for another job. He doesn't want to continue being a professor, having to tutor students and board them and all this. He's looking for a government job. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, he, he names them after Cosimo. And in the little book, he doesn't exactly 
come out so strongly in favor of Copernican system, but he does throw out a very interesting statement. He says, some people have trouble with the Copernican system because they can't understand how the Earth can keep the moon in tow as it goes around the sun. But of course, everybody agrees that Jupiter is moving. And Jupiter now can carry its entire retinue of little moons with it. He doesn't understand why, but it's a fact of nature. He can see that why not have the Earth do it as well. And that then becomes one of the principal bases for his work. I think Galileo loved his sleep. Uh, Venus, the brightest nighttime object after the moon, he didn't observe for his book. Uh, it was in the morning sky. He would have had to get up early. <laughs> but he's got the new job in uh, uh, Florence. He moves to Florence, and Venus is moving into the evening sky. And now there's an interesting thing about Venus. There's no way of knowing for sure if it shines by reflected light or by its own light, but with the telescope, you have an opportunity to see that Venus has phases, which would be reflected light. Now here's the Ptolemaic system. The Earth solidly fixed. Venus, with its epicycle, is locked always in the same direction as the Sun. So in the Ptolemaic system, Venus is always between the Earth and the Sun, and therefore mostly you're looking at the back side. So essentially what you would get at best would be a half phase. On the other hand, in the Copernican system, where Venus goes around the Sun, now I've fixed the Earth just for purposes of demonstration here, Venus could show the entire gamut of phases, from a full phase to a thin crescent phase. And here are the observations. Venus did not look like much in those early days in August because it was so small compared to Jupiter as seen in his telescope. Now, as time marches on, he got a letter in November, around the middle of November from his young protege who said, by the way, you should be looking at Venus. Maybe it will make a test between the Ptolemaic and the Copernican system. Galileo was thrown into some panic. Uh, if his uh, protege Castelli could think of this, so could the uh, Jesuits down at the Gregorian University in Rome who had the telescope. And Galileo, of course, felt that with his new job in Florence, it was incumbent on him to make all of the discoveries. Uh, so, but what if Venus was always beyond the sun? What if it's never going to go into a crescent phase? Then that would be very embarrassing to uh, say that uh, this was proving that Venus uh, went around the sun. So what did he do? He, he made a rather mysterious statement in Latin. Then he completely scrambled all the letters. He sent it on, in a message to Cosimo's brother, who was ambassador up in Prague, knowing full well that he would give it in turn to Kepler, who was a wonderful cryptographer and would go nuts trying to figure out what it meant. <laughs> and then he bided his time, and he observed Venus, and by the beginning of January, he realized it was definitely going into a crescent phase so that Venus had to be going around the sun. And so he then uh, sent the solution up, and it was Kepler who published both the anagram and its solution. Translated, it says, uh, the mother of loves imitates the figures of Diana. Got it? Uh, uh, the mother of loves, Venus, uh, has the same phases as the moon. So that then meant that Venus goes around the sun. Does that prove the Copernican system? Well, no. Because Tycho Brahe, in the meantime, had come up with his own system, which has the Earth in the middle, solidly fixed, the two great luminaries, the moon and the sun, go around the Earth. 
and in this system, Mercury and Venus and Mars go around the sun, carried as the sun moves around the Earth. So, Venus goes around the sun, shows the full set of phases, and the phases don't prove anything about whether the Earth moves or not. But, we're so used to seeing this, doesn't that look right? But of course, we're all brainwashed, we're post-Newtonian. We've got the physics to back it up and it makes sense. But Galileo, putting these things all together in his book, uh, and, and he was by this time uh, had gone down to Rome trying to persuade the hierarchy not to uh, put too much onto the, Copernic to, uh, to the Ptolemaic system. Uh, there were problems in Rome at that time because they had all those Protestants north of the Alps uh, who were uh, having their own way of interpreting scripture. Rome wanted to keep this in the hands of uh, a central authority. Uh, they did not like the idea of Galileo sitting down there and saying the Bible teaches how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. And uh, uh, in general, giving some hints about how to interpret scripture uh, to reconcile with the Copernican system. After all, the Bible says in Psalm 104 that the Lord God laid the foundation of the earth that it not be moved forever. Isn't that a pretty definite condemnation of Copernicus? Uh, it was Kepler who pointed out that that scripture could just mean that the basic stability of the earth which made life on earth possible was what that verse was talking about, not about celestial mechanics. In any event, Galileo got permission from the, his friend, the new pope, Urban VIII, the Florentine, uh, to write about cosmology after he had basically been silenced. But I think Pope Urban VIII felt terribly blindsided by what came out. He was probably expecting a very dry geometrical treatise on cosmology. And instead what he got was a very lively dialogue written not in Latin but in the uh, common tongue in Italian. And here are these guys who are busy doing the discussion. What these on the frontispiece are uh, Aristotle, Ptolemy, and of course Copernicus here with his heliocentric egg beater. Uh, this is, uh, uh, but in the book uh, there, were, there was Salviati, he was the mouthpiece for Galileo, and there was uh, Sagredo, the wise neutral man who generally agreed with Salviati, and then there was the Aristotelian Simplicio. Uh, that was the name of a sixth century Aristotelian commentator, but of course all the Italians knew it was a splendid pun on simpleton. Uh, now, Galileo, was desperately looking for a proof for this system. He knew that the phases of Venus made good sense. He knew that the retrograde motion explanation by Copernicus made good sense, but neither were really proofs. But there were the tides. Galileo was convinced that you would not have tides unless the earth was in motion to get the water sloshing back and forth. This is, of course, completely fallacious. Uh, but uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, Galileo was keen about this argument. And the Pope told him that even though that might be a good explanation if the earth were moving, that the Lord God, uh, being all wise and powerful, could have created the tides in many other ways, including those beyond human intellect. So Galileo, rather unwisely, placed exactly that argument in the mouth of Simplicio uh, right at the end of the book. Urban VIII was convinced that he was being made a fool uh, and he brought the uh, whole uh, wealth of the Inquisition onto Galileo. 
Here is the typical view prior to Galileo and Copernicus with the earth fixed in the middle and heaven with all the angels and so on arrayed just outside the starry sphere. It was such a radical change that it was hard for Rome to adopt that. Was Galileo a heretic for suggesting that the earth was moving? Well, it hadn't been publicly so announced, but Galileo was brought to trial and uh, on the vehement suspicion of heresy. And Galileo said no, he had never believed that. I think he was prevaricating, but uh, that's how it is. But this is one of those phony Victorian era paintings. Uh, he is sitting there, standing there, whispering in a stage whisper, but it moves. Of course, he was a smart guy. He wasn't about to do anything as dumb as that. Uh, <laughs> and he was in the white robes of a penitent, uh, kneeling before the inquisitors at that particular moment. So as I say, the picture is all kind of crazy. But nevertheless, his book essentially uh, argued for the coherency of the Copernican system. It couldn't prove it, but it made it intellectually respectable as something one could entertain. And hence, I think that his dialogue on the great world systems has to be thought of as uh, the book that won the war, so to say, uh, to make the Copernican system really believable. So anyway, that's uh, in sort of a nutshell some of the issues that are going on interestingly in the Copernican revolution. Uh, very clearly uh, something that uh, is just uh, uh, part of the secondary literature, but not always entirely right. As for Galileo, of course, we wouldn't say he's a heretic, he's a hero. Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the Physics Department of the University of Michigan, by the Dr. M. Lois Tiffany Endowment, and by gifts from friends of the program. Local broadcast is made possible in part by Pfizer. Pfizer.